thank you every everyone for coming to this uh, to this meeting today and thank you for joining us today for the first of our virtual coffee for confined yogi so we have participants for about six continents and 30 countries we are here in a global community of yogis look, looking to for ways to use the tools of yoga in this difficult and time of global pandemics so we have about three virtual coffee scheduled for next month. My hope <clears throat> is that we will hear different voices and learn from each other how to maintain and deepen and strengthen our yoga practice in this period of confinement, of narrowness. The main theme of this virtual coffee is how do we live our yoga in this time of confinement. Our first guest is Eyal Shifoni, senior Ayangar teacher from Israel. Eyal is known for his open heart and for the many books he wrote and on the use of props for your, our yoga practice and also for his book, Psychophysical Lab, Yoga Practices and the Mind-Body Problem. I am really excited that Eyal agreed to be our first guest. He has been an inspiration to me first when I found his books many years ago and when I met him in person. Eyal is a gifted teacher because of his generosity and poetic teaching. His latest, latest gift to us all was the immune system video that was, has been circulating when the pandemic started. This video speaks about Eyal's open heart and generosity. Today with Eyal, we will be focusing on the aspects of yoga which is beyond our physical practice and postures, asana or, or pranayama. We are going to be reflecting on the philosophy supporting our physical practice in this period of confinement. Before we start, just one ground rule for all our participants, we will allocate time toward the end of, a session, of our session together for your question. If you want to ask a question, please raise your virtual hand on the Zoom app and we will randomly choose questions, then we will spotlight you so you can speak. So with no further ado, ado, please join me in welcoming Eyal. So Eyal, as we start today, I'd like to ask you, how did you come to yoga before we start with our confinement today? And what drew you to yoga and sustain your interest all those years? And also, when did you meet BK Sayanga? Well, <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank you, Rachel, for inviting me for this uh, meeting, for this session. I'm honored. And um, I'm excited to speak to all this. I, I don't see everybody. There are 145 people. So I just thank you for joining us here today. Um, so how did I start yoga? Well, uh, since I remember myself as a child, I was attracted somehow or of the stories, you know, the mysteries of the yogis. And um, when I uh, did my army service, which is compulsory in Israel, somehow a book about yoga, the first book was in Hebrew, uh, came to me and I started to practice according to the photos that I saw in the book. And uh, when I was released from my army, I was immediately looking uh, for yoga. And uh, I was at Jerusalem at the time, I found a yoga teacher. And I remember from the first class of the Tai took, I knew this is my path. This was in 1978. And uh, 10 years later, I um, went to Pune first time uh, to study with BK Sainga. This is uh, the time that I met him first. And of course, after that, I kept coming like every other year for one month to study with him. And what uh, keeps me in the practice is just um, the joy that I get every day. Every day I practice in the morning. And uh, when I finish the practice, I feel quite balanced and uh, joyful. And this is a gift of my life and I will never stop the practice. Thank you, yeah, this yoga is really a gift for all of us and, 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 in, and now what's happening in our period of confinement, in the reality of our confinement. 
So we have, many of us experience that confinement as a little bit of a narrowing of our lives, maybe even our hearts. How in your mind do we find ways to expand our being in this difficult situation? So. Well, first of all, a confinement actually, or a retreat for the, you know, it's part of the yoga tradition. Uh, many yogis, you know, went for a long retreats in, you know, some isolation in the Himalayas or other places. And they actually, when uh, I was traveling, teaching in uh, the end of February, when uh, the, all this uh, pandemic broke, and uh, when we came back to Israel, I, I was in, I had to go to isolation. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, I was very happy that uh, I'll have more time for my practice and my study. Well, it turned out uh, to be that it didn't work like this because the Zoom business came in and uh, we teach, actually we teach all the classes, so I'm busy as much as I was before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, generally speaking about uh, the situation, I think that um, in this time, <clears throat> we, we find ourselves uh, in the same boat, the whole globe, is under the same crisis and uh, we are all fighting or struggling for help. And I think it is, um, it makes very clear the observation of yoga that there is a very uh, common aspect in all human being. In spite of, you know, individual differences that always exist, but uh, there are many things that are common and the most important things that all human being, they want to, to live peacefully, health, with good health, to be safe, and to be happy. This is common to everybody. And this period makes it, uh, you know, very real that uh, we are all in the same boat. And this can create a lot of connectedness between, mm -hmm. uh, between all of us. So talking about connectedness and thinking about what you just said about there is a communality that we found in our in our intros in our yoga but what is it exactly that we found we found in the introspection in the feeling of going inside so can you speak a little bit about the power of the quiet mind or maybe the quiet heart in this in this confinement so going to the himalaya is something but staying in your room when you feel isolated and have to go inside how do we find the tools for that quiet heart or the quiet mind? Uh, well, I think that uh, if um, you have a stable practice in this time, you are lucky because you have the tools already to uh, keep your uh, quiet. Um, the peace of mind is something that comes uh, the fruit of the practice. And uh, actually, Patanjali is talking about quiet mind. Uh, Chitta Vritti Niroda is quieting the Vritis or the movement of the consciousness. And um, it, it says that uh, by devoted practice of all the Ashtanga Yoga, the eight limbs of yoga, uh, all the impurities of the mind, all the Vritis and the Kleshas and all the uh, affliction of the mind uh, disappear. And you, you get uh, true wisdom Pagnia and uh, Viveka Kyati, discrimination. Mm -hmm. So a uh, quiet mind uh, brings clarity. Mm -hmm. And when you have clarity, you can see the reality. So I think um, in this time, uh, to have a stable practice, if you already have a stable practice, you're lucky. If not, maybe it's a time to develop it. Yeah, so but stable practice is a gift, right? And sometimes most of us cannot have that stable practice or no, not all of, all of us all the time are able to practice and find that quietness. So Patanjali also give us some, some attitudes that we need to foster in, in this time and in the time of global crisis, maybe even more. So how do we, how do we bring ourselves to do that? How do we bring ourselves to the mat? What are the tools and what are the attitudes that we need to develop or, or foster for ourselves? How do we do that? So, well, Patanjali is talking about the two main tools are 
Abhyasa and Vairagya, it's discipline of practice and renunciation. And they are also potentially give us the qualities of the heart that uh, we can develop this by exactly by thinking about the common aspects of all human beings. And the, this feeling of connectedness that, uh, as I said, is very obvious now, uh, that we are all uh, experiencing and we're all sharing the same destiny. And this uh, brings, you know, the feeling of uh, what Patanjali said in Sanskrit, Maitri, which is translated as loving kindness. But you can say friendliness or um, just feeling that they uh, care about other people. And from this caring about other people and wishing well to other people, uh, when you see somebody suffering, automatically your reaction is compassion. You want to help suffering. And if you see somebody successful and joyful, it brings you happiness. And this is mudita. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you see evil people, people that are behaving violently, aggressively, then you have to keep your uh, stable mind equanimity or upeksha. So these four uh, qualities of the heart are also very important in this uh, time. And people that are more emotional in nature, they can go in this uh, direction of Maitri, Karuna, Mudita, Upeksha. And uh, by practicing, just thinking about the, the commonality and wishing well to other people, uh, we can, uh, it, it's one kind of practice of yoga. Uh, we have the asana practice, we have all the ashtanga yoga, but we have also this, uh, what potentially give us in the first chapter in uh, Sutra mm -hmm. 33. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, but it's not so easy, right? It's not so easy to find the peace of mind when things are not going well. So when things are going well, it's very easy to say, I have the peace of mind. But when the world is really around you and moving at a very difficult, difficult feeling, how do we, do we create that? So how do we, in a minutia of the practice, how do we manage that? So you are, you, you have been written, so I can, I can, you have been, uh, writing the book about the psychophysical lab, yoga practice and the mind-body problem. So you talk a lot about emotion and how our yoga practice, our asana, can change those emotions and that in the minutia of doing. So could you address that a little? Yes, sure. Uh, so I think, uh, first of all, there is a lot of uh, fear in this uh, time. And uh, actually fear is a nature response which is positive because we cannot really survive without being afraid. But when it comes out of proportion, uh, it turns into anxiety. And anxiety is not a positive uh, thing, not a positive emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in order to, uh, yoga is, you know, is bring us to balance and to stability. And, and we keep, you know, the right proportion. So if it comes out of proportion, I mean, if you take measures to keep your, you know, to keep your health, you keep all the regulation, all the restriction that uh, the government uh, uh, subscribed, then, then uh, it's okay. But once you are busy with this uh, too much, it becomes an obsession, obsession, and then it's become negative. So, um, <clears throat> I think the practice can help us a lot. Uh, first, you know, I think in this time, I can give one advice is that uh, everybody should ask himself, how, what is the proportion of the time that we are busy with reaction to the corona situation? Uh, if it's like all the time that we are up, we are thinking, you know, uh, updating yourself, get information, going to new, thinking about worrying, then it's not very healthy for our uh, mind. So uh, the practice of yoga can take us away from this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, um, we have <clears throat> in, the, in the book a few sequences that uh, are suited for different kinds of emotions. 
Um, I want to connect it to um, the three instinctive reactions that uh, we, we react when we are, find ourselves in danger. Uh, so I think everybody knows about the three Fs. We instinctively, when we have immediate risk, we either fight, flight, or freeze. And uh, it depends on your uh, constitution, what will be your reaction. And uh, I think people who are, uh, tend to fight, then this situation maybe will take them to some kind of aggression, anger. Uh, and for them, we have in the book a sequence of relaxation, calming down, yeah. observing the emotion and open the body to uh, slowly make it quieter. People who tend to uh, uh, flight, I mean escape, they need more confidence. So we have a sequence to develop confidence. And this is mainly a lot of standing poses, uh, strenuous like the Viravadasana poses that uh, build confidence and also inversions and backbends. And uh, for people that uh, tend to stagnation, uh, like the freeze response, uh, often they are uh, tend to depression because you know stagnation inaction is can bring to depression and uh, in this we have a sequence for uh, joyful which is a lot of back bends and quite dynamic opening the chest when you open the chest immediately you feel better so in the book we offer i think uh, sequences that can um, help in many situations, many emotional uh, mm -hmm. uh, states. So, so you, give, you give us in your, in your book all that, all those tools, the, the toolkit of those sequences. And that are, they are certainly helpful in this time of confinement. But that, the time of confinement that we are here can also tell, maybe teach us something about the prob the the not only about the practice of doing but about the practice of vairagya the practice of non-attachment of letting go so it has brought this period has, has brought a lot of changes to the way we live in a sense we are forced to let go of holding and we know and you just said that a little bit before that it's our attachment that leads us to suffering right so can this period in a way become an opportunity to learn what is vairagya non-attachment what does it mean to let go in this period what is the end game of letting go in this period uh, yeah i think what you said is correct because many things were taken from us uh, the carpet is like is pulled under from under our feet and the things that we used as kind of escapes whenever we have some desire or some unpleasant feeling we tend to escape like meet other people um, yes uh, go to a coffee house or travel to some place now we cannot do we are we are, we are forced we lock down at home we still can communicate and uh, there is also one escape that is there is the fridge and this could be a problem. But uh, basically, we, many things were taken. And, uh, and then, you know, naturally we go, we, we can develop our vairagya in this situation. I mean, of course, it, it's your choice. You don't, you can find escapes always. But uh, as a yogic choice to develop vairagya, uh, and vairagya actually is, well, it's, if you don't, People don't know from the audience, it's a desirelessness or renunciation. And it is a total acceptance of reality. And the reality now is the epidemic, a pandemic. So um, if you are busy in worrying or in thinking about what will be after, you are not in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the present moment, there are a lot of things that you can learn also. And a lot of 
benefits also that you can get even from this crisis. So Vairagya is actually to accept reality as it is. Uh, usually we don't accept reality as it is. We want something else. Not to want something else is Vairagya. And um, well, I, I can talk more about it, but I don't know. Do you want to? Yes, actually, actually, I think that Vairagya is one of the most important lessons that we can learn. It's the practices, the asana practices, the sequences that you give, we all know them. But the problem of Vairagya, of letting go, is a process. It's not something that we have. Definitely. Definitely. So how do we foster that? And, and that's different than doing the asana, like doing a back bend to, to feel joy. It's a little bit different approach to who we are as human beings. Yeah, there is a, the side of Abhyasa, which is the positive side, which is the active, which is the, uh, some effort that you have to, uh, to invest in order to transform. And the Vairagya is the other side, is learning to accept. And um, one of the things, for example, in this situation is that we find that uh, many things are not in our hands. We cannot control everything. Mm -hmm. And we cannot do what we want always. And we cannot have everything. Uh, and um, to be fine with it, to accept it. And, and, you know, and, and to be fine. Not to be devastated because you cannot control the situation is Vairagya. And uh, the, the chances to, to learn to accept and to say, okay, now I cannot do things that I wanted to do, but can I be okay with it? Now I cannot control the situation. Many things are just happening and it's a, it's a big lesson because you know, we, we really control very little. We can control some aspects, but there's so many things that we cannot control. Mm -hmm. Even our own body we cannot control because otherwise we all stay 20 years old, but uh, we cannot control the aging process. So um, just accepting this is, is Vairagya, to mm -hmm. accept the reality and all the limitations that are, come with the reality. Uh, but accepting is very difficult for us, right? It's yes. not something <laughs> that we do very easily to accept that we're aging, to accept that we are, need to stay in the house, to accept that this is reality. So what are the tools that we have to accept reality in this situation? You know, it's always about observation. I mean, it's always a practice, the sadhana, uh, because if it would have been easy, they would not, would not need to do yoga. It's not easy <laughs> and it's not our automatic response maybe. And uh, in this time, it's really time to observe our automatic reactions or like automatic pilot. And what is important for us? What do we choose to invest our energy? What are our priorities? And for a yogi, the priority is to go deeply into the practice and by going deeply into the practice of the asana, the uh, concentration and meditation, and also the yama and the yama, all the eight limbs of yoga, uh, will develop a ragya. It's not, I'm not saying it's easy, but um, this, is, this is our practice. But Eyal, so what in, your, in this time is for you the most important yamas and niyamas? So if, for our audience, and I'm saying most people know what yamas and niyamas are, but there are, there are different translations for that. But let's say it's ethical principle, universal principle of behavior, moral injunction and observances. What is the one that caught your eye in this, in this time of, uh, of, uh, of confinement? One of, one of our audience talks about Santosha. She wrote something about mm -hmm. Santosha might help. So yeah. those... Okay, let's start with the Yamas. So I think the most important Yamas now relevant to the situation is Aparigraha. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have to give up many things, and because um, Parigra is trying to have uh, more and more hoarding and possessiveness, and uh, 
This time, many people suffer also economically, financially, and um, we cannot have what we used to have, maybe. And uh, it's time for maybe to develop more simplicity in life and to realize that we don't need so much to be happy. And this is a paragraha, simplicity and knowing that we really don't need so much to be happy. So this is when I think the yama, another yama is the satya or truthfulness. I think it's also important because um, we are so uh, bombed with information and we tend uh, to pass it. I don't know how it is, I guess it's all over the world this time, but here the WhatsApp works uh, extra hours <laughs> and they say that if you don't have a space in your uh, smartphone for all the messages of WhatsApp, you can uninstall the Waze because you don't need Waze anymore. <laughs> the navigation <laughs> program. Uh, so people tend to uh, pass information without thinking. Is this is not satya? Satya is that you don't pass information that you didn't verify it is correct. Uh, this is part of satya. And also being kind in, uh, in the speech, not hurting other people. Because we are still communicative, even if we don't meet, still we are communicative. Yeah, absolutely. So this is about the yamas. If we go to the niyamas, I think, yes, santosha is definitely very important uh, niyama to develop in this time. And uh, I want to suggest a little practice. You ready for a little practice of santosha? Absolutely. It's okay? Absolutely. <laughs> So I ask you, the audience, I don't see you, but uh, I ask you to think about something that uh, you cannot have now and used to have. And uh, ask yourself, did I, when I had it, did I change it? Did I feel gratitude that I have the things that now I don't have? So probably you can find something because usually we are, we just look at what we miss, what we don't, we don't have. And uh, Santosha is to, uh, to look at what we have and to be satisfied with it. So um, then uh, you can think about something that you have now and that if you lose it, you'll be less happy. It could be anything. It could be even the simple fact that we woke up this morning, we have another day that we can breathe, that we are relatively healthy. Maybe not perfect health, but we are healthy. We can function, we can walk, we can see, we can hear, we can think. This is all things that we should not take for granted. And we still have place, you know, house and food, which is not obvious for most of people on earth. So just thinking about all the things that uh, we have, and if we not, will not have them from some situation, it will be very difficult for us. And then we will think, oh, how come I didn't cherish it when I had it? Now when I don't have it, I suffer so much. So Santosha is to look at what we have and to be satisfied. You know, Johnny Mitchell had the song, uh, uh, you, when you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Mm -hmm. Santosha is, that you should know what you've got when it's here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's still here, before it's gone. That's right, that's right. So one of the things that I think I learned a lot through yoga is to become aware of my taken for granted assumption. Taken granted assumption of my body, and not only that, of how I see the world. So that taken a granted assumption brings me to not being able to see the world the way it is. So if I am aware and becoming aware, and that's what the viveka, the discernment piece comes in. If I become aware of what's happening each moment as I do, I can become aware of what are the taken for granted assumptions, and then maybe there is a space there to develop santosha. Yeah. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, that's uh, true. And it's also I think, a space to develop a uh, upeksha, or in the Bhagavad Gita it says samatvam, which is equanimity and balance, stable mind. Because uh, by the only way to develop it, I think maybe not the only way, but one of the ways to develop this 
is to watch uh, your reaction to pain and pleasure. And um, the moment you have some sensation, you have usually automatic reaction. And in the asana, because you take the time to observe, and because you experience different sensations in the body, you can watch your reaction. And uh, then, you know, actually equanimity is to have a proportional, as I said, proportional reaction, not to be proportional. So um, to be balanced. And uh, in the yoga, I think we can learn it because by observing very carefully the sensation and the automatic reaction, and what is more, more important, or not more, but as much important, is to have some space between the stimuli and the reaction. And then there is time for some discernment. And then you don't react automatically, but you respond. Mm -hmm. In English, there are two, these two words, which is, I think, very beautiful. It's difficult to translate to Hebrew, but there is a different b difference between reaction and respond, because respond is after you do some evaluation of the situation, mm -hmm. and then give a, a better reaction to the situation. Mm -hmm. okay. Not necessarily the automatic one is the best one. No, like, somebody attacks you, and you, uh, and you react with anger, or hatred, usually things will not get better. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's better, you know, you, you can uh, resist, you don't have to accept violence, but if you do it out of anger or hatred, then the outcome will not be good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you a few questions about practicing and teaching. So about, uh, about your practice and your teaching in this time. So Judith Lassiter, which is another senior teacher, has said, I practice for my students and I teach for myself. What is your relationship between your practice and your teaching in this Zoom situation, in this confinement situation? Well, uh, first of all, I, um, I get a lot of inspiration to keep the, the teaching, although it's not easy, um, because I see the need of the students. And uh, here in our center, uh, in the beginning, uh, we didn't know how they will react because, you know, we cannot give them the same, the same uh, thing that we used to give them when we could see them face to face and touch them. Uh, but still, uh, surprisingly, I almost, I think about 90% of the students attend the classes, the Zoom classes. And you can see that it is very important for them. So uh, <clears throat> this gave me a lot of uh, inspiration to keep teaching. Um, and uh, I think it's funny because many people think that uh, yoga is some kind of isolated practice. And as I said, there is period of, might be a period of isolation, but now you can see how much it's also um, about relationships with mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. and I think what also keeps the students, our students, is that they have personal relationship with the teachers in the center. And these relationships are very important. And you know, we, we call, the, we, if we see some students that are not attending, we call them, we try to help them, maybe with technology, maybe just to encourage them. And so, um, yeah, I think this, uh, this is what important in teaching in this time for all teachers. Mm -hmm. So, so it's so zoom is as a double edge so in a sense we don't like so much zoom but it gives us something very important is the communication but what you said is very for me it's very important is that you said it's solo we do it solo right we do yoga solo but we want community so what kind of yoga community do you, would you like to create so we have now maybe choices of what kind of community we want to create in this difficult time and maybe take it after the time? Uh, well, I think everybody that wants to study yoga, you know, uh, there is a saying in yoga that uh, the, you don't choose your students. The student chooses the teacher, but not vice versa. So uh, for me, anybody that wants to study yoga, 
uh, seriously is a good, you know, is, can be, is part of my sang community of the practitioners. Um, and you mentioned Zoom, so I think it's another uh, thing that uh, could have uh, some tosha because uh, uh, as much, you know, as it's, it's not the same, but still the technology, the modern technology is uh, very handy this time. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, it uh, facilitate, facilitates, sorry, uh, our ability to uh, I think it's very important. And this is something that even five years ago, we didn't have. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. About the, I don't know, the Spanish, a um, uh, hundred years ago, the black, uh, and you think about people who were isolated and didn't even know what is going on and didn't uh, have any way to communicate with the family, with the friends. It's a totally different situation. So technology is a great boon. Yes, but the communities that we create, you said we do not choose your student, but you have a will to create a community, a yoga community. And that yoga community, because you want to give something to that yoga community. So as a teacher, what is it that you want to give to your students that you haven't chosen that come to you in this time of confinement? What is it that you want to give? Well, I want to give them all what yoga can give, which is for me, the stability, mm -hmm. equity, joy, of course, good health, but, but also physical and mental health, and um, quiet mind and open heart. This is, uh, I think, the most important thing. And uh, if you have quiet mind and open heart, then you're in, uh, you're in a good uh, situation. And this, mm -hmm. this I try to give to myself and to others. So where do you find your joy in this time? Where do you find your connection in this time? Yes. Well, it's a practice, of course, and it's relationships with family, with the yoga community that we're keeping in touch. And it is also nature because we are lucky here, we live close to nature. And even if in this lockdown, we can still walk uh, in the nature. We really just walk about 50 meters from our house and we are in the nature. Mm -hmm. so nature, I think, is also a very important uh, aspect that you can find a lot of joy, a lot of uh, quietness in the nature. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to open it in a few minutes, uh, in a minute to, to, our, to our audience. But one of the things that for me, uh, that you just you said during this time we are talking, is that the practice of Patyaha and the practice of being out needs to be in balance. So you are teaching, if I understand you correctly, that there is, to, there is a need of balance. And in this time when the balance has been, has been shaken because we don't have balance, we are in a certain confined position, the balance is a balance of you with yourself, right? In a sense. Would you agree to that? Yes. Uh, I want to give a quote of Goji. Mm -hmm. okay. um, a stable mind is like the hub of a wheel. The world may spin around you, but the mind is steady. So I think it's very beautiful because um, in a way the, the, the crisis is not balanced, but we can keep our balance. That's right. That's right. You can keep your balance. If you have, I mean, again, if you are have already a stable practice, you are lucky. But uh, in any case, the, the practice can help you to keep your balance, even if the whole world is spinning around, as Guru just said. Good, good. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to open it now. If, if, if we have some questions, please raise your virtual hand and we'll spotlight you and then Eyal will answer your question. I'll try to. <laughs> Is there any question? So Jennifer, you had a question I see here.
So if I look at the at the chat the chat room, uh, Madeleine asks, where can you find the sequences of flight, flight, fight, and freeze? They are in your book, right? There is. There are yes, in this. this is the book. Thank they you. In your book. Thank you for showing it. Yeah. Um, well, at the end, the last chapter of the book is uh, sequences. We have uh, uh, five sequences, but some of them are given in two levels. So actually, there is more than five. And uh, one of them is for relaxation, that, uh, for rajasic uh, state of mind. Rajas is hyperactivity and uh, irritation. And then you need relaxation. Uh, so you, inversions are very good and supine poses and uh, poses that you stay longer time, like Setubanda uh, Savanyasana Viparitakani. And um, the sequence for tamasic state, which is like when you're low energy, um, maybe slightly depressed or gloomy state, and you want to cheer up, you want energy. Then the sequence of dynamic sequence, as I said, with a lot of back bends, and the sequence to build confidence. So these are the three sequences. Also, there's sequences for just peace of mind or emotional stability, general sequence for emotional stability. So these are the sequences and you can find them in, in the book. And um, yeah, you know, the art of sequencing is, um, you know, the sequence uh, that we, we give in the book is just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as you come mature in the practice, you can, start from these sequences and build up your own according to what you need, according to your constitution. Mm -hmm. okay. So I think we have one, one raised hand. Uh, Lisa, can you spotlight Marion Sinclair? Oh, no, her is from London. Hello, yeah. Marion. Hello. So, you know, I've been thinking, um, you know, yoga is an individual, it's an inner quest. But actually, at the moment, we are really lucky. We have the ability to retain our stability, you know, and to, you know, be the, the hub in the center of the wheel. And it feels to me like our responsibility now is to reach out to others and offer them some of that stability, a taste of that stability. You know, as teachers, we, we somehow need to park what we would be normally doing, stop thinking so much about ourselves and actually think about giving what we can through teaching yoga. Because we know, you know, students who are being taught through Zoom, at the end of the class, they're saying, I felt better after the class than I felt all week, you know. Mm -hmm. So just for myself, being taught by you online through Zoom has really helped as well, you know, to, to keep. So I, I'm just wonder on your comments about maybe a change of a, a change of approach to think about going out to people rather than being more focused internally. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you also for joining my online class, uh, workshop yesterday. <laughs> Uh, well, I think uh, that uh, for me, at least, yoga is not only isolation. Of course, you have your own time when you isolate yourself for the practice, not to have distractions. But it's actually yoga is should be for life, uh, to live a better life. And part of life, I think, is relationships is very important. And I think actually one of the measures or the criteria that you can assess your progress in yoga is the quality of your relationships. I think that if uh, relationships are not good, probably something in your personality is still not mature, not developed, not balanced. Uh, because people, you know, especially people who are close to you, they know you, you cannot pretend. So it's not special to this time, but that, uh, that yoga is uh, being, with yourself, but also going out to the world. But yes, you're right. And this time it is even more important because there's more need. There's more people are, you know, suffer from anxiety. They suffer from 
worries about the economical situation. Many people are really, really in a very difficult uh, situation. Some people even risk their life, you know, especially the medical crews, uh, that uh, many of them lost their lives even. So there's a lot of need. And this time of need, we can offer, you know, what yoga can give. And, uh, I think, yeah, this time it is more, more about giving and sharing what we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very well put. Oh, Ohad wants to ask a question. So, Lisa, can you? Ohad, Ohad well, is uh, my friend and uh, my student and my neighbor and co-author of the Psychophysical Lab. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Um, I actually just wanted to make a small comment, uh, namely that, uh, as I see it, uh, part of the acceptance attitude that um, uh, we ought to develop is um, really to be very, to be as flexible as we can. And as an example, I'll just give the, you know, adoption to Zoom technology and, for instance, teaching yoga and also uh, I teach um, other stuff. So it's, uh, I hear a lot of people complain about how difficult it is to teach uh, through Zoom and so on. You don't have contact and so on. On the other hand, like I said, I think we should be very grateful to this um, um, device that uh, enables us to, to connect and to, in the context of yoga, to maintain uh, yoga practice, yoga teaching and so on and enable us to meet. So it's just, just one example of how I think we try to make ourselves as flexible and adaptable to a new situation. So as, as this is part of uh, what I see as, um, you know, not holding fast to things, is to be able to, to modify habits and, and things once you... So I, I find this an opportunity. I, I don't want to give examples from other uh, situations, but for instance, you know, not being able to work where you're used to work, now you have a ch challenge to work in, in a different situation. And, you know, take it as a challenge is, is one thing that I think helps to take this new situation as a kind of, you know, new enriching uh, experiment, if you like. Eyal, do you want to answer that? Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, well, of course I agree. And uh, there's also some advantages of the situation and, um, you know, many things fall apart. Uh, it's true. Uh, but uh, also many things say uh, like many innovative ideas that out of the restriction and the limitation, people always come with new ideas. And this is time of new ideas. And one of the things also that I see that uh, many students that usually don't, are not able to practice at home, now they, they, they are forced to practice at home and maybe something good will come out of it because maybe they'll develop some habit. And then when uh, the confinement started, we told all the students in the center that they are welcome to come and pick up props. And then now at the center, uh, I sit in the center, but you don't see the, the storage, but the prop, it's almost empty because all the props were taken by the students so they can continue the practice and uh, I hope many of them will be able to continue practicing because I think self-practice is, mm -hmm. is great, you know, is a great joy and, and benefit of yoga. Yeah. So, uh, oh, you have one other person uh, raising your hand, Asha Ghosh. Can we spotlight Asha? Thank you so much and thank you for such a wonderful talk. Um, Where are you from? Can I can you hear me? Yes, but where are you from? I'm in the US now, and I saw you, I think, two years ago in Venice when I lived in Austria. And it's ah. a really mem it was such a memorable workshop with you. And I was thinking about this question about what's the most important thing to be giving to students now. Mm -hmm. uh, because in a way, to be able to give them beautiful memories from this time also is something that maybe with our own practices since we're able to have that and maintain that I was trying to think beyond being stable and available to students what else could I think about really giving them so they also have maybe some beautiful memories from this time as well. Great, 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 great Asha. Great question. Eyal, do you want to answer? 
Well, I think I mentioned that we reach out for students. Uh, we keep you know, touch with students through communication, through telephone, WhatsApp, email, uh, Zoom, everything. And uh, yeah, we try to encourage, to offer as much as we can. And uh, also we, we made uh, significant discounts so people that suffer economically can uh, continue the practice. It's very important for us that everybody will continue. We also did some classes for children or for family that uh, since children are at home so they can practice together with the parents. These are things that we can offer and we're happy to, to do so. So this brings me back, that question, and if I may, I, this brings me back to the power of the relationship between teaching and practicing. So sometimes, it has a, happened to me during this period, I've woken up with the feeling that this is not going well, but I knew I was about to teach, so I have to practice. And by, by that relationship with my students, I created that well-being for myself. And, I, and then I was able to give that well-being to my student. So there is that relationship which is so important. And as you said, you just said, Asha, beautifully, what do we give in this time? So what, where do you get your inspiration? Where do you get that ability to give? So maybe there are books, maybe there are poetry, maybe there are music. There are many ways for us to re-engage re ourselves and be able to give. And I think that it's in the giving that I become, it's bigger than me. So the yoga is much bigger than me. So I'm connecting to the yoga and through the yoga, maybe I can live better. So this, this yeah. is... Yeah, definitely. It's two ways, relationship, teaching and studying, because I think the best way to study something is to teach it. Because mm -hmm. when you are forced to study, and my uh, students are my best uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's a given and take. Uh, and, uh, you, the practice, you know, one of my uh, teachers in the TTC, the teacher training, he said that uh, the proportion, time-wise, proportion between uh, practice and uh, teaching, should, practice should be double time than teaching. Mm -hmm. And I stick to it. Mm -hmm. stick to it because I think uh, I need to prepare myself to, in order to be able to teach. Yeah. So we, we are almost going to at the end of the time that we're together but i before we, we we end and i'd like to ask you what are your hopes so i think uh, parallel to uh, the three reac instinctive reaction that i mentioned that uh, either fight flight or freeze our society can uh, come out of the crisis in three outcomes one is developing more cooperation between societies and nations and caring about, because we, we realize that we are connected in this anyway and we are in the same boat and we affect each other. Another option is um, that uh, it become worse because of fear. People will isolate themselves and nations will build walls and there will be less. And another option, the third option is the freezing, the stagnation, is that the samsara will come in after some time, things will come back to what, the, there will be no change, people will not learn anything from this. Mm -hmm. uh, my hope is the first option, uh, that uh, people will be encouraged to, to uh, have more cooperation, more open heart to other people. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this outcome, if this will be, then maybe we'll gain something even from this uh, difficult situation. So uh, we are going to take another three, four minutes and we have one more. Uh, Last, uh, just one. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Because often, you know, from difficult uh, situation, you build up character and you become, and in, in, in this respect, uh, my guru, because Anger is an uh, inspiration because he, started very low and he passes through very, very difficult times and see where he got to. So, um, you know, recently I was studying more, I gave a lecture about his life and I studying and I was impressed by, you know, where he came from and where he got to. And this is, I think, could be inspiration for all of us. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. I see. So I think we, we need to close. So um, it's like uh, people are, are starting to leave. So we're going to, to close. So I just let me just uh, say a few things as we're closing. And first, Eyal, I want to thank you very much for your generosity and for sharing with us. Also, I want to thank the audience for, of people coming from all over the world to listen to Eyal and to be part of this, of this uh, uh, virtual coffee. I want to thank the Iyengar Yoga Association of New England and Artemis Yoga for helping me make this coffee a reality. Without them, I wouldn't be able to do that. I just want also to announce that we have two, no, two more, two next scheduled virtual coffee, one on May 3rd at 12 with Karen Stefan. She's one of the first American students of BKS Ayanga in France in 1972 and the co-founder of the first Ayanga Yoga Center on the East Coast. And on May 17th, we will host Patricia Walden, senior advanced teacher and one of the most dedicated uh, students of Mr. Ayanga. And we don't, I don't need to say more, much more about the, those people will we'll talk to them, but I want to say just about that their kindness and generosity and wisdom like you, Eyal, will help us navigate this strange and difficult period. So I hope some of you will come back for the next virtual coffee. And Eyal, I'll give you the last word. So if you want to say anything, anything that I haven't, you know, haven't a chance to say, please. And thank you so much for everybody that came to this place, to, to this office. I just I want maybe to repeat what I started with, is a thank you for this opportunity to talk to people. Mm -hmm. And thanks again for all the audience for coming and uh, listening to me. I hope we gain something, we learn much together, something I learned, they learned. So yeah. learning is always good. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. We, I have learned a lot and thank you for your generosity. Thank you everybody for coming. Namaste.